usually I'm guessing that it's been set up by a general business attorney who thinks that you know a lot of a lot there are a lot of very good business ideas out there probably to some degree what Joe is describing that make perfect sense but because you're in healthcare and healthcare is treated completely differently from almost any other industry out there you just have to set it up differently so it, again stark civil you don't have to mean to violate it if you don't meet all the elements of an exception that you're trying to do or even an exception maybe you're not intentionally doing but if you don't meet all the elements and you, uh, you know the relationship can be viewed as improper you've now have a bad relationship and the government can say any billings related to that were improper and not allowed and can come back and recoup all the money that was paid uh, and I kickback statute is kind of the corollary uh, criminal law so you actually do have to have some level of intent although that keeps getting eroded further and further it used to mean you actually used to have to specifically intend to violate the law now you don't even have to know you're violating the law to actually have a violation of kickback which is kind of scary uh, seems to me counterintuitive to criminal law, which always, be, you know, criminal, you have to intend to violate something. Um, but kind of where all this ties back to is, you know, there is, the government rightly or wrongly has a big concern about referral relationships and the relationships with patients and why certain services are being recommended. Um, connected to these laws, there is also certain, there's civil monetary penalties law and uh, false claims act, but Kind of where I think Joe's question of going with the innovation is, you know, is the you know, are you encouraging patients to use these tel or the providers to use these telehealth benefits, and is it either causing unnecessary care to be provided, or are you providing arguably a free benefit to the patient? Because as I think as Joe is saying, you know, and again, this is my interpretation without having the full background of you know the exact details, but. What it looks like is you, you're offering what's essentially a free benefit to the patient. The physicians, it sounds like, are recognizing some uh, monetary benefit on the back end from their employer. But it kind of sounds like, again, you're offering a free benefit to the patient. So they, if you're a patient with the MGPO, you can get access to these telehealth services that aren't going to cost you money, arguably. So from the government's perspective, that sounds like a patient inducement. So you're offering them this free benefit to encourage them to keep using your your other services, which you can bill for and charge the government. So now, you know, in the government's infinite wisdom, that is arguably, you know, if you're not meeting all, all the elements and, and, you know, getting into extreme details, every single scenario you can think of is going to have some variable that's different that can result in a different outcome, that could potentially be a patient inducement issue, which is then a violation of the fraud and abuse laws, which jeopardizes the whole relationship and can result in those many multi-million dollar settlements <coughs> that we all see grab the headlines. Okay. <laughs> uh, I <th> believe <laughs> we're going to cheer it up here in a second. <laughs> um, yeah, and th this is why I talk about HIPAA primarily. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I told you this was coming. I gave you a fair warning. Now, I, I um, it, it's serious, uh, and I can be as glib as, as I want because I'm the moderator here, but, but it is serious. <laughs> We're taking it seriously. Uh, we'll figure out a way to, to, to deal with it. I, I think um, what I would encourage all of you to do is not take that as a reason to run and hide. Again, the snowball's rolling down the hill here. We have to actually do the opposite, which is bond together to get through some of these well-intentioned, but not 21st century statutes. Yeah, uh, I guess the, my the only thing I'd kick in there is, you know, if you're in a Medicare, you know, like the Medicare Shared Savings Program or a Pioneer ACO, the government actually did something extremely helpful, which is if you're in one of those programs, there are waivers from exactly the fraud and abuse laws so you can experiment. Yeah. With the next generation ASUs, you're starting to see, you know, again, act, you know, the encouragement to utilize different things. And then regardless of where you are, you know, if you're in a risk-based arrangement, there are exceptions to the Stark Law Safe Harbors and a kickback <laughs> statute with, in my opinion, uh, the extremely deficient advice. I've relied on them in helping to set up some relationships, but there is zero commentary really even in the regulations that created them so it's a little bit of a wild west there again you know i think as i said at the beginning it's not i don't view my role as being a stopgap and saying no to people i say i love that idea let's figure out how to make it work great 
Yeah, no, I didn't mean to imply that. And, and again, uh, uh, like the government, our legal friends are here to help us. So um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to turn now to technology. Turn now to technology to Bob. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I gave a, a, on purpose, futuristic and uh, somewhat whimsical uh, uh, account of what the Internet of Things might do for healthcare. Uh, half hour or so ago. Um, one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about because time is, is always limited is how the front end of that, the, the user work to get on board for virtually any wearable or any mobile experience is still too hard. It's still too hard for most of our patients anyway. For most of us it's we do our, that's how, what we do in our life. We download an app, we put in our credentials, and we start to use it. But we find that Bluetooth pairing, uh, downloading, all that stuff is for certain of our patients particularly challenging. So I wanted to ask Bob to just talk to us a little bit about, from his perspective as a technologist, what's coming down the pike to make our user experience uh, more pleasant and easier as we interact with mobile devices and particularly from a healthcare perspective? You know, I think at some points it's not about the technology, it's about the operations and the planning and that you're giving this, you're presenting this into an environment, how are you going to support this and who is going to? Um, I was involved with a lot of, you know, telehealth, telepresence kind of projects in the communities and what we learned really quickly was the support teams were not capable of taking it out into the home. There's, what we found instead was much like the home health organizations that are usually partnered with the hospital that deal with, you know, bed deliveries and walkers and they specialize in that support model of going into the patient home. We're starting to see companies that specialize in that with the technology. I worked uh, quite a bit in the intelligent health org with uh, Vivify Health and it's the same thing. It's a turnkey, they have the 24 seven support for when things aren't working, the overnight equipment, it's all boxed and ready to go. So from a patient perspective, you're opening up easy to use instructions instead of all these other cords that came with the device that you don't need and you know, why is there a, a UK power supply tied in with all these others, it's just a scale. So I think we're gonna see more specialization like that and hospitals will partner with the experts to say, you will take care of that 24-7 support, the break fix, the logistics of it, um, the escalations. We talked about portals a little bit, wanted to give a couple more examples where, you know, I found it as a guinea pig, some good, some bad. And one was when we were doing, for my daughter, we were able to send otoscope photos of her ears to the pediatrician for quick, quick triage. Do we need to come in or not? I got pretty good using the iPhone of knowing this is definitely an infected eardrum. Let's go in. So it cut down on the time and convenience. And that was a product that was made specifically for new parents dealing with that situation. And it was easy to use, snap on, clear instructions, and working with our care provider. So it was a seamless function. When my hospital rolled out a portal and we started doing some things with blood pressure monitoring. Well, my wife was having to get blood pressure monitoring throughout the day and then she also showed our young son how to do it and she started he started doing it and I pointed out to her you realize all that data is going somewhere right and it was like, oh I'm like yeah now we have who do we call to say rule out the last you know four hours worth of very odd readings that have been coming in off of a seven-year-old um, but again this is what we're gonna have to think about and as we move that tech out of what, where it was a nurse or a nurse's assistant in a hospital taking those controlled readings to now an automated process that is beyond our eyes and ears. And then lastly, it's the 24-7 support of this tech. And that, you know, hospital IT, they go home at night like everyone else. They only get called when things break and it's really bad. Well, I got, a, I got some liver panel results after my last physical and through my portal. I got it on a Friday afternoon. And I spent all weekend Googling the results and freaking out because um, I'm so qualified for that, right? And I'm like, I've treated my liver relatively well. Why are these, you know, I, and so I'm calling every clinician I know to get results until my primary care physician opens on Monday and then can actually read the results and walk through and explain why they're this way and know you're not going to keel over right now. 
So this 24-7 access to that information that we're feeding into these portals through these machines, and sometimes we're not necessarily qualified to interpret the results. So when there's that anxiety, when there's that panic, if we're working business hours, how are we gonna handle patient care with kind of this new, always on, always connected, you know, uh, healthcare strategy? So just some examples of what we're gonna have to start really thinking about and thinking through as we start to enable patient care outside of the hospital. Yeah, I like those two themes, the 24 by seven, that's <clears throat> one of the reasons that American Well is, and Teladoc do their own networks is because they can offer that uh, in the virtual video space. Uh, and we're even our group, which does a fair amount of partners of monitoring of chronic illness in the home, our uh, tech support is a nine to five operation. So it's, uh, it is an interesting, interesting dilemma. Oshner Health System in Louisiana, I think they're Louisiana, um, <clears throat> does something called the O-Bar, it's like the Genius Bar, where people can take their devices in and uh, uh, someone will help set up their apps and connect their cuffs and things. That's an interesting model as well. So we have 15 minutes left. I promised uh, time for open mic and karaoke. Uh, and so I'm, anyone who has a question, let's hear it. Otherwise, I'll just keep yammering up here. But you probably don't want that. So questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, you. Uh, so my question is actually for Brian. So you talked about Please repeat the questions. Sure. I mean, so the question was basically, you know, how can um, loved ones or family members have access to patients' electronic health records? And obviously, you know, from from my standpoint, um, you know, it's all access driven, but you need the proper authorization so that they can, you know, some people can access their elect um, their family members' electronic uh, uh, health record. Others cannot. Uh, even over the phone, when, it, when a call comes in and, and, you're, and a family member wants to speak with a nurse manager on one of the units, you know, it, the, the nurse has to go through with the proper steps in the electronic health record to make sure that this is someone I can speak with. And it's not someone that has been really restricted or, or someone that the patient didn't want um, you know, to, to know the results. So, but um, that's really all I can say about that. I don't know if you have any Anything to chime in on? Yeah, the, the tag on to the question was in legal issues related to the access. And you know, I think as Brian just said, you know, the authorization is obvious, is really a key. You know, under HIPAA, you family members, you know, can get access; they're not denied. Um, but if you have a signed authorization, that's always going to trump. You know, if the patient gives a specific directive or a specific permission that, you know, that's that's kind of the golden key in terms of what you can get. Uh, you know, for example, I mentioned earlier that I switched providers. When I went for my first visit, I got a whole pamphlet of, you know, new patient documents. One of the documents was, who would you like to get, who would you allow to give permission to your records or who can we talk to? And it gave blank lines that I could fill in. So I filled in my wife. So that way if something's going on and she needs to get access, she can now call and be able to, you know, get the information. But even as a baseline within HIPAA, there is the ability for family members who are involved in someone's care to get access. It's kind of one of those ones where you have to give the opportunity to give permission or for the person to object to it, but it's not one where you absolutely have to get permission before the information can be shared. So actually, I just wanted to tag on to your comment about, um, you know, Go for it. About being, you know, as we're thinking about empowering the patients and, you know, where all this data is coming from, you know, I certainly, from the personal perspective, agree that we need, you know, we see it in, you know, in our daily lives and you have all the data coming in, but, you know, I was actually talking with my wife who is a primary care physician before coming, you know, last night before coming this morning and she's like, I get flooded with data as a physician. And I think it's a very valid point that as we're thinking about empowering the patients, we have to do it in a collaborative nature with the providers. We have to make sure that the providers aren't just flooded with information that they can't utilize and that they're just gonna either ignore or they're gonna look at it and throw their hands up in the air saying, I don't know what to do. You know, from the from legal perspective, I'd worry about liability. If they're getting all this data and then they're not reacting to it because if they're 
if that data is showing a problem and then that they're not doing something and the patient has an adverse outcome, I can just foresee a malpractice lawsuit coming. But I think from the practical perspective, we can't just be throwing raw data. And I think it goes back to Joe's slides where it's, you know, even from the individual perspective, the raw data is not going to be helpful. You want to have it interpreted and you want to have it come at you or presented to you in a format that's usable and that actually gives you something to be able to utilize. Yes, uh, it's a good point. I, um, <clears throat> um, I, I concur with that. Other questions? Yes, please. You mentioned three stages. We got a mic. We got a mic. Oh, right? we got a mic now. We're in the 21st century. You mentioned three stages: aggregation, analytics, and engagement. Do those have to happen one at a time, or can they proceed in parallel? Oh, I'm hoping they'll proceed in parallel. They one again, one informs they each inform another. All the things on the data aggregation side, all the new sensors, all that's going to inform the analytics to create something that's much more personal and unique than we can do now. Uh, but I'm sure the deep learning people here, and I love that term, right? Deep learning. They can say it to me, and they can trump me because I don't know what that that is, right? So it's great. Anyway. Um, I'm sure they would tell you that they don't need all of the real-time data. They can, they can put up dummy data sets to, do, to make the machine learning algorithms better, right? And there are, let's face it, there are industries that are doing amazing things with hordes and hordes of data uh, uh, that are ahead of us on this. So I'm sure we can learn lessons from them as well. So I think they can happen in parallel. Engagement, it's kind of its own animal, actually. That very much can happen in parallel, because that's really much more about understanding psychology and understanding what motivates you individually, uh, and then targeting it. Thank you. Um, I can relate to Dr. Quetta in terms of uh, physician engagement and even the consumer engagement. As we are getting into the industry where patients are being treated as a consumer, physician burnout. Uh, I'm a primary care physician and an IT uh, physician at the campus. And the very challenge we face in the industry right now is big data always bring, <coughs> bring big problems. And I think this is what the physician, uh, clinical inertia, if you remember 10, 15 years ago, the evidence-based medicine came about. So we are facing now the health informatics clinical inertia that we just don't know what we don't know. So to um, Matt's point, I think I have a question for you. As the Medicare and CMS is coming out with this uh, ECHO project, which is the Community Health Outcomes Extension, which is telemedicine project, and all this legal framework and ecosystem of whether it's IBM Watson, or even Amazon Echo. I know Amazon is doing a lot of great work with uh, Boston Children's Hospital. How do you see the legal framework or the regulations uh, helping the ecosystems of healthcare? To your point, Dr. Guerra, I think the MVEL and partners and the physician who wants to do it on their own, it's all part of the same ecosystem. We are not competition. Even CVS and Walgreens is part of the same ecosystem. The healthcare ecosystem is facing a lot of challenges right now. And how do we help as a provider to get engaged at a better level? Because most physicians are walking out of the industry for a very reason, because not only they have a technology inertia, they have a business inertia in terms of how do they perform better to provide better care. Because NIH has already laid out the statistics that we spend as a primary care one hour a year <coughs> with our patients, one hour. On an average, a consumer spends one hour a week on technology for their health information. There is a huge gap. I don't think this gap is going to get filled in 2021. I would love to see that, especially for me. I would sign up today, but I don't think we're going to see that in the next five years. Comments from, uh, from the panelists? I guess from, to get tie into that regulatory question, I think the key one, and I'm going to guess a lot of people in the room are familiar or maybe not have read it in full detail, but are familiar with the macro rule came out, I guess, two weeks ago at this point. Um, you know, I think the key is comment on it. You know, the government needs to hear the voice from everyone who's on the ground. They can't, you know, I think it's clear that, you know, admin, acting administrator Slavic keeps going out talking to people and he, you know, 
I was actually listening, I think it was on, what, today's Thursday, on Tuesday, I was listening to the, that new Pulse Check podcast from uh, Dan Diamond, and he was saying they're trying to become, you know, individual, you know, patient-centric, you know, provider-centric. They don't want to just be regulating from on high. Um, whether or not that's the impression that's given by the new rule, you know, I'm, I don't really have a view on it, because I'll be honest, I haven't read it, the 960 pages, because I don't have time. <laughs> you know, I rely on other people who have done summaries. Um, but I think the bottom line is be engaged, be active in it, because unless everyone's voice can be heard, the government and the regulators aren't gonna understand what's going on and what the impact is, and to arguably it's too late when the regulations have been finalized, and then you're trying to fight the harder battle of getting new regulations to come out to change what's in place. You know, I think meaningful use is probably a pretty good example of that, where you know, there were probably very good intentions, but then the application clearly did not go in the direction that was intended. There's a hand up in the back. I don't know if the mic can get back there. Oh, good, Cindy. So Joe, it's a little bit towards, you made, you made a comment about uh, open scheduling. So um, understanding that both what we just talked about, all of this data flooding into the physicians, plus this whole idea, oh my God, I'm schedule, and, you know, I don't have many time as it is. To, if we put on our consumer patient hats, um, to us it feels like it's a heck of a lot of excuses yes. for going where we want to go, and yet completely understand the other side of it, and yet we seem to be, get stalled here. So I just wondered if there was anyone who, whose organization or company was doing something perhaps in that space for aggregating all this data that is coming in for the physicians. We seem to be spending a good, I mean appropriately amount of time aggregating it for that patient to give us that lovely SAM. But where's that SAM, I'm thinking, to the physician? Uh, a panelist may have comments. There's one, uh, so it's a great question. It's, it, it's something that I call out as an area that's a strong need for, for uh, in the innovation space. Um, that's part of the aggregation normalization that I spoke about. There is a firm, I don't think they've quite done this, but it's certainly their vision to do it. It's called Validic. And what they've done as a start is created a, a basically an API library so that any wearable can easily get connected into one <coughs> central area where they will collect all those data and uh, represent them in a way that isn't quite as chaotic as what we see today. So it's a start, I think, but uh, I think sorely in need. But maybe you guys know of, of someone doing this that I don't. I haven't seen it as an overall solution, but more individual hospitals are taking it as like a departmental mm -hmm. initiative. So okay, we're discharging patients on the uh, you know orthopedic floor. We want to make sure that they're actually getting up and walking more than when they just see their physical therapist. So they've issued a Fitbit and they're tying that data in. So it's I would say not a strategic initiative to use consumer grade wearables, but more tactically oriented around you know different pain points that they've witnessed where they feel that they can use a device that hasn't gone through FDA certification that is not critical, patient care critical, to the point that, you know, blood pressure monitoring or heart rates are not within the, the right tolerances. But I see a lot of that innovation, just little departments adopting it to solve one problem to better meet the needs that they feel for their, their base of patients. Um, and that's not just in the U.S. I'm, I'm seeing it quite a lot overseas where I think they feel there's less regulatory or, or less legal risk. Um, and, and trying to look at that. How can we do it smarter? How can we do it faster? How can we better support our patients cheaper? I would agree, and we're also trying to do it, uh, at least from our standpoint, based upon our clientele. So we're not trying, we don't want to overload and send every piece of data to, to, to every single doc because, right, then they're just overwhelmed and, and, and they've got enough going on as it is. But based upon the different types of population that we have, the patients that we serve, you know, we want to bring it down to what's pertinent to, to the physician needs to see for this group of people that, that are in the assisted living group versus the, the people that are in our skilled nursing facilities. You know, so whatever those you know, key data fields are, we, we, we work alongside with the nurses and the docs to, to determine what those key drivers are. 
and uh, focus on that so that there is no overload. And, and Joe, you mentioned before, you know, in the time that this, this person was on hold, I think your CIO was on hold, he made a, a reservation for a car and a hotel. These things are all very stagnant. That, so it's either there's rooms available or they're not. And if, they're, if they are available, what type of room do you want? Very simple. When it comes to scheduling for, the, for a physician, there's so many variables there that you, know, the, you could think that it's going to, going to take 20 minutes with this patient. But once, once the doctor gets in with that patient, I mean, one, the patient wants to spend as much time there if they came down there and they, they, they want to, quite frankly, get that personalization and want to spend and get all their questions answered as long as it, poss as long as it takes. So what should take 20 minutes might take an hour and then scheduling is backed up and then consumers get aggravated because their appointment was at 9.30 and they're not getting in until 11. So it's, it's a cycle that there, there's so many variables that, that are in there. Um, it's not as simple as making a car reservation or a hotel reservation. Th those are relatively stagnant and simple. Well, we, we keep people waiting that way with our current scheduling systems as well. So I, I, uh, I mean, I, sh I should be agreeing with you, but I'm going to push back a touch on that. Listen, we're at time, folks. I want to uh, first acknowledge the panelists and give a warm round to them. Uh, any, any comments from our uh, chair, session chair at all? No? I guess we're going to break. I, I will say, I'll, I'll leave you with a shameless plug. We have books over here, and I'd be happy to uh, see you in the corner. We'll be selling and signing. Thanks.